All right. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Welcome to today's webinar from SCM Connections. My name is Mike Raftery. I'm here with my colleagues, Pat and Megan, and we're going to go through uh, demand planning in IBP and all of its glory. Uh, a couple of logistics. This will go um, not the entire time, so we're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end. If you have questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the questions section, which you should have on your GoToWebinar uh, session. And then that should allow you to put a question there. I'll go ahead and moderate and interrupt them if they can. We're going to keep everybody uh, muted because the attendance is fairly large and it'll get a bit chaotic uh, otherwise. So, and this will also be posted on our YouTube channel as well for future reference as um, if you need it in the future. So with that, um, Megan, let's go ahead and get started here. Welcome everyone. Um, we've got a, a real good webinar. This is actually one that was of popular demand, which was, can you show us everything uh, that, that happens in IBP demand and how you would actually run a demand planning process in IBP? So you asked and we delivered. Uh, introduction overview is just a little bit about who you are and what you're gonna see. Then we'll walk through the demand planning in IBP and follow that up with a live system demo, which is um, where we're going to go. So a little bit about us. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We are SCM Connections. We are a supply chain transformation firm working mostly with SAP applications. In this case, today we'll be looking at SAP's integrated business planning or IBP platform. Uh, we've been around this space for quite a while. I see a couple of familiar names on our attendee list, so welcome. Uh, we've been around um, for about 18 years in the APO and IBP space in SAP uh, for planning. And as a company, I think I've been around seven years now, seven, eight years, um, doing projects, um, making projects work for our clients, making sure they see the, the actual benefit. So I like to say that we make the tools work. We don't just implement them. We make them work for you. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, we're an SAP Silver partner and a recognized expert in supply chain management, which, which we're pretty proud of. So that's what gives us license to do things like this, which is to host a webinar on integrated business planning for demand. So let's go ahead into that. Um, this is us. My name is Mike Raftery, CEO of SCM Connections. We've been around for, for quite a while. Uh, my specialty is uh, supply chain architecture and systems design, mostly in supply. I've done a little bit in demand, but not as much as these two. So, Pat, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick to the group? Uh, yeah, my name is Pat Green. I've been uh, working in supply chain solutions for almost 20 years now. Um, various, I've kind of split my time between demand, supply, network supply, as well as PPDS. Um, but lately, I've been focused a little bit more on the demand side of things, uh, which is, you know, to me, pretty exciting. i um, worked in various industries from pharmaceuticals, life science, uh, chemicals, uh, automotive, et cetera. So lots of experience. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Really looking forward to this uh, session. It should be fun. Awesome. And Megan, do you want to give a little about yourself? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. All right. I'm Megan Berthium. I uh, started out my career in manufacturing. Uh, realized that I really liked the SAP suite and wanted to learn more. So I uh, got into some demand planning and APO and uh, kind of just continued my career. Now I'm uh, moving into the IBP space, uh, primarily uh, demand and inventory optimization. Okay, cool. Okay. So Pat, this is where I hand off to you, kind of walking through the overall IBP demand planning cycle. So why don't you uh, take it away and, and wow the group here for us. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Hey, hey thanks. Um, so really the one thing about IBP, for those of you who haven't spent a whole lot of time in the space or coming from the, from the APO side of the house and from SAP, um, it's really a different planning cycle. And if you kind of go through it, it's, it is a cycle. It's really designed to be a cycle. Um, but if when you think about uh, your, your planning, the one thing that's always missing is the financial piece of it. Is it you kind of your traditional uh, APO would be demand planning, supply planning, and then going into detailed scheduling. Um, but within IBP, you've got the financial integration, which really kind of takes takes the, the planning process to another level. And explicitly, we have, in addition to just our normal demand and supply, 
you would have the inventory module, which also kind of helps you solidify those financial positions and really give you an understanding, not only quantities, but also the dollars involved in your inventory management piece. So we're expanding the cycle with an IBP from demand, moving through inventory, managing your supply, using optimization, using all the kind of standard algorithms, and then really analyzing the financial impacts of your supply plan, your demand plan, the revenue implications, your inventory positions, et cetera, and taking that a step further to really understand how your plan is going to impact the financial capabilities of your of your your company, especially lately with everything going on with COVID and kind of the drop off in demand in some companies and really the spike in demand in others, uh, certain product lines, et cetera. It's really kind of key now as we kind of come out of this and emerge out of the, the lockdown to really understand how we're going to manage things going forward and the financial implications. So that's one of the key things that IBP does. Um, and the companies are finding a lot of value, especially when there's a lot of uncertainty like there is now in the market. So uh, next slide, Megan, if you don't mind. So that that's kind of new for everyone um, from IBP. Uh, you know, and as we kind of think about it, the, we're going to talk a lot more today about the demand planning process, right, and how IBP helps in that regard. Um, really, the kind of focus here is developing a, a more accurate mid and, and uh, short and midterm statistical modeling, um, react faster to short-term demand changes with pattern recognition um, and based algorithms, machine learning, uh, within our, the demand sensing. So you kind of got that long-term statistical modeling, consensus planning coming out of your SNLP process, and then kind of that short-term reaction within demand sensing to say, this is what's happening on the, you know, on the street and how my customer demand is pulling through or, or backing off and reacting more uh, hand to mouth. Okay. And then really what does that do? It drives more accurate deployment of product-based, um, deploying inventory to the right spot at the right time and you know one of the things the big benefits there is the the ability to eliminate waste within your supply chain and minimize your inventories because now you've got a more accurate forecast that more accurate forecast in the short and the midterm can then allow you to minimize your inventory levels get better customer service um, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, within IBP, it's the collaboration piece, right? You can now extend your planning process, your demand planning process, not just within your organization, but externally through the web interface um, very easily with, uh, with the IBP web interface. So now you're bringing not only your customers, but in, internally you're bringing your customers and extending your, uh, your knowledge base, your, your uh, um, your planning algorithms. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so, you know, if you kind of look at, uh, you know, the building blocks <clears throat> for demand management, really the, the big thing here to think about is it's bottom up kind of moving to a consensus forecast. And that really drives your sales and operations planning process, the consensus demand planning. So, you know, you've kind of got four, in this case, four triangles. Um, but really, that's kind of what you're driving to. And that's kind of what we'll show a little bit later on in the demo. Uh, but it, it, it um, consists of, you know, your statistical forecasting, really, what is the math telling you based on, you know, your sales history, et cetera. Your demand management process is the human element to say, well, you know, sales is telling us this, our marketing team is telling me this, um, how are we gonna, you know, the commercial side is has a whole nother number, uh, what they're seeing on the, in the market. So how do we bring that piece of it and, and manage the demand? And then finally, the demand sensing at the lower level is the ability to then take the math behind, you know, what's happening in the very near term, one to weeks uh, at, at the customer level and then start executing and adjusting your forecast of those short-term demand spikes and, and drawdowns. Um, all of that kind of fits within the consensus demand planning, which is really your long-term uh, strategic plan, uh, what you're going to make, you know, um, driving your long-term plan so you can take more strategic uh, initiatives and direction within uh, your planning process. Okay. Um, go ahead, Megan. Okay. Um, you know, and if you kind of think about the levels and your planning horizons within how this fits in demand planning, demand planning isn't just it's a standalone 
solution or a standalone process, it's really, it, you're really doing demand planning to drive your supply planning, right? Make good decisions on your supply plan based on what your demand or your, your potential demand is. And really you kind of take your, your three levels, your time horizons and that short term, the response side is really that short term horizon, high frequency, uh, you know, things that are happening within the, in the sales cycle um, in the customer service cycle at the DC. And you think through your operational, really that's the forecast driven planning process. Um, that's a weekly basis, right? You're looking at uh, movement within your, your forecast and your demand, you're looking at your capacities, et cetera. And, and again, your demand planning process is really helping to drive your supply planning process. So you always have the right product for the right customer at the right time. And then really, if you kind of look at the, you know, the long-term horizon thinking tactically, right? And we're not going to say this is strategic, but more tactical on the monthly basis, this is really your sales and operations planning, right? You're looking at monthly, uh, do I have enough capacity? Do I have enough uh, uh, material to, to hit my supply plan? Do I have enough, uh, do I need to look at external vendors or co-manufacturers, et cetera? Really taking a, a strategic slash tactical look at your supply chain and then seeing what the demand how the the demand can flow in and out and adjustments that can be made to your demand as well as opportunities to make better long-term decisions okay all right next slide <clears throat> and then kind of here's some of the the big reasons why you'd create an accurate forecast right we, we talked about a couple of them but really higher sales uh, service levels leads to stronger customer loyalty, lower inventory levels, obviously, not only within your finished goods, but also throughout your supply chain, better use of working capital, um, i.e. what you can, you know, a good uh, demand plan allows you to then start thinking about weaning off your inventory levels in conjunction with your demand planning to now think, think about creating a more accurate plan, as well as managing your inventory more effectively with like, with like an inventory management module okay leads to more consistent production you know what you're going to make when you're going to make it uh, what your demand is um, you can have more consistent production schedules lower risk of product obsolescence um, and then expedited freights etc okay next slide um so from a process perspective and, and really you know one of the things that we've gotten some questions about what's the whole process of demand planning and as we kind of put this uh, webinar together we, you know we kind of thought through the process the demand planner kind of does things in buckets right they do their daily work they do their weekly work they do their monthly work we're kind of saying what the overall plan you know here to create a product or demand plan um, rather than the tasks that happen on a daily weekly monthly basis so really we're talking in our demand planning our monthly cycle we would have you know the product life cycle new product introductions retirements etc um, you know those are kind of the first pieces of it right to say what what's new what's old what's coming what's going those are the things that are coming out of your you know your teams and your new product introduction teams that moves into then your statistical forecasting which then is really allowing the system to do the math for you and then come up with a number based on your running the algorithms to come up with a forecast and a demand signal but based on your sales history typically and if you're using more advanced methodologies specific causal factors and um, other data that you can bring in to get a, a better math driven um, forecast but coming out of that isn't that's not where it ends right because typically the math isn't always perfect and there's things that you don't always know right you may have you know customer interactions, you may have demand that, um, you know, is coming out of the, <clears throat> that you're not seeing in the math, and math tends to be a backward looking, you know, the statistical forecasting tends to be backward looking or is backwards looking, and then you're trying to project the future. So is the process here is consensus planning, which then takes your statistical forecasting and then add the, a layer of inputs to come up with a plan that is more based on what you think, you know, what everyone's gonna agree upon, the sales team, the marketing team, your demand planner, your forecasters, maybe your local demand planners, kind of rolling up to a number that's gonna drive your overall supply plan. And then finally, at the end, we go through and we look at performance metrics, analytics, et cetera, make sure that you're doing the right things, adding value, et cetera. Okay, so that's kind of the overall process or the overall 
demand, creating a demand plan. Again, there's lots of activities that, you know, it's not just one single long linear process. So there are a lot of activities that go on between um, each one of these steps. Okay. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Megan. You kind of take the rest of the, these slides. All right. So I am going to start with kind of giving you the structure of the products that we're planning for today. Uh, so kind of the hierarchy, we're going to use that term loosely, but uh, we're going to have a, a brand. We're going to say that we're planning clown supplies. Uh, then we have all of these different SKUs. These are all the product descriptions, basically, that go along with the SKUs, right? So white paint's going to have its own material number, own SKU number, red paint, same thing. Um, and where I'm going to start is, uh, you know, you come in on Monday morning as a planner, an analyst, uh, whatever your role is, and your boss gives you a new product. And you need to forecast for that product, but you obviously don't have any history. So how are we going to go about doing And we are going to, uh, sorry, having some mic issues. So we're going to start with new product introduction. So product lifecycle management is new product introduction is just one facet of that, right? Because you have um, your end of life, you have uh, maturity, you have this entire product uh, cycle that that really happens. But for this purpose, we're going to uh, kind of talk about the whole product life cycle, and then I'm going to go into the uh, actual application in IVP and show you how we would set one of these uh, new product introductions up. So just to start, we're going to we're going to phase in, right? So in the life cycle app, you're going to see there's a phase in curve. And basically, uh, in that curve, we're going to define uh, when we're going to begin our forecasting. Uh, then there's a launch period, right? Uh, your ERP system has this new, this new, um, new product, and you need to basically align the data so you have a, a forward-looking forecast. And then phase out, that would be more of the end of life, right? Those are the end of life SKUs. And then that last step there uh, is just the realignment process that you would use IBP to utilize. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go right into Fiori. So uh, you're going to see here product assignments. So this is the Manage Product Lifecycle app. Uh, and you're going to go in. And you're, you'll see the different product assignments. So our new product is this ultra light no, clown nose. So uh, we had the own, old clown nose, it was too heavy. So we have this new light version. Um, it's composite so, nose. <laughs> yeah, this is the composite <laughs> nose. So uh, you'll see here a lot of different options, but the main thing that I want to show you is before we actually go into the app and go into the assignment, is that there is a way to automatically do this. You can automatically upload an assignment. You can download the assignment. Uh, this is the manual way to do it. And the reason I'm doing this is just because it's, it's the, I want to showcase what, what IPP kind of is doing behind the scenes. So you'll notice here that we have the ultralight clown nose. And this is going to be the material number that's associated with this new product. OK? And You'll see here there's product assignment, so you need something to reference it off of. So we're going to do IBP 100. This is the old version of the clown nose, and you're going to assume that you're going to have a similar uh, forecast. So uh, we're going to say that the, the weight, we're going to say we're going to keep it at 100%. So if you're sure that it's going to have a similar structure, then you would use this 100% function. And so this valid to and valid from, uh, valid from and valid to, rather, uh, this is important when you get to the end of this uh, this product's end of life, but for what we're doing here, it's not exactly important. And offset, we're not going to use any offsets because we know when the forecast date needs to start. And then uh, you can use functions like simulate. So you can actually utilize, there we go. We can actually utilize a simulate to see what the actuals were of this reference product that we're utilizing. Okay. Hey Megan, and before so, we move on, just talk about the weight a little bit and sort of the different ways. You have a hundred percent, but it doesn't need yeah, to be a hundred percent. Right. Yep. 
you can so if you, like I said, if you're a little unsure about what the actual structure is going to look like, you can say I'm going to do 50% on one product and 50% on another. Or if you don't think it will ever get up to the sales because you still have your old product, uh, maybe you only want to use 50%, and you want to do a gradual linear rise in what your for, what your new product is kind of going to look like. So you have multiple options here in your reference in your reference product IDs. Uh, for this purpose, we're just replacing our old nose with a new lightweight nose. So we're just going to say it's 100%. And, and we also had a question about the from and to dates. And at some point, just address those one more time. Yep. So I'll address it here. Um, the product assignment from and to is the total length of the product's life, basically. So you'll say that this is for four years. This is the valid from and the valid to, and this is going to allow the user to uh, utilize like a longer history maybe if you want to go all the way back to 2018 to forecast forward for your new product. Uh, that's kind of what this is going to allow, allow the user to do. And so this is the most important part. This is the forecast. So how are we actually going to get the finished good, the new, the FG126, the ultralight, how are we going to get that a forecast? And so uh, here we have any attribute value as the um, delineation between where we're uh, where we're forecasting. So what that means is that at every single product, location, customer combination, I'm going to get a forecast for my new ultralight nose based off of that reference product. And so this is going to be your forecast start date. And our forecast start date. Um, oh, sorry. Let me go back. Actually, I need to talk about this the phase in curve. So you have a lot of options for your phase in curve. Okay, you have sublinear, superlinear, linear, cube root. And um, what that kind of is going to look like is, let me show you. What can you expect to see, okay, when you're looking at your new forecast? And this kind of gives you a good indication of where we're going to start. So when we look in Excel, you're going to be able to see that when it start, when I start my week one of my forecast date, my forecast start period, that's going to be 10% of my forecast. 26. Well, we'll think of it as as that regard. So you can see a linear a linear curve for your phase in, uh, for your forecasting for your phase in. Okay. And so we'll talk about the phase in and the, the phase in start and then the phase in end. So Phase and start is where, okay, we actually uh, want to start forecasting, we want to start creating that supply. And so we're going to start that date on the same date that we're going to start forecasting for this model. And maybe you uh, have a pre-launch of two weeks or something, and you want to actually start forecasting two weeks early, you have a two-week lead time. Uh, that's where you'll adjust this forecast date to be two weeks before your phase in. But we'll, we're, for this purpose, we're going to have forecast and phase and start at the same time. And so ultimately, what you want is a phase in end. So what that means is that your product is coming to maturity, basically. And your product, your new product, is now going to rely on its, its actuals, its sales history, to create a forward-looking forecast. And uh, the next thing is the phase out curve, the phase out and uh, phase out start and the phase out end. And that is really a continuation of the end of life. So we're just starting in this uh, new product. So we don't know exactly when this is gonna reach its end of life, uh, when the new ultra ultra light model is gonna come out. So uh, for now, we're gonna leave that blank, but you have similar, uh, you have a similar curve that you can actually see, so. Uh, what I'm going to do now is go into Excel and actually, oh, here we are, and actually show you what that looks like. So, what does that look like? So, here is our original clown nose, okay? And we're looking at Excel. Um, right now, we're just filtered on the uh, product description, customer, and location. And what I want to show you is that IBP does not fake put in fake data. So a lot of systems I've seen, they'll put in a fake actuals. Um, 
into this new product to actually generate the forecast. But IVP doesn't do that. You see that I don't have any actuals. I'm looking, looking, looking. I have no actuals history, okay? But I told IVP I still want to start forecasting based off of that original nose. I want to start forecasting in this current week. And so you'll see that I'm at 280 uh, and 281 for these combinations. And I have now a forecast in my uh, current week for my ultra, my, my brand new product. And you'll see that it's gonna continue to rise. It's gonna be that linear curve that you're looking for. And, uh, and so this kind of ties into my next feat is that I wanna go into the actual statistical forecast model. And so what I really want to do is I'm building like I'm building the blocks for Pat to make a consensus review for him to make a consensus decision on uh, where we're going to go for it for the SNLP. What 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 are, what are we going to use as our consensus review? And so this is one of the the points that um, that I, I I'd like to make here. And so the next thing that we're going to go into is our forecasting model. And so your stat forecast is, uh, you know, the math behind the math, what IBP is essentially telling you to do. And so we're going to quickly go through this forecasting model, but uh, I'm going to break it into a couple of segments. So I'm going to go into first the pre-processing because I want to show you guys the outlier correction, and then I'll go into the actual forecasting steps. And so we'll start here with the time settings. And you'll see that this model is at week. Uh, so that means that it's going to look back 52 historical periods, 52 weeks, and it will go forward, look forward at uh, 52 weeks to forecast out. And so how does this tie with new product introduction? And if you see this little checkbox right here, instead of product lifecycle management, how did I get a value into that uh, new product? Well, this is how I did it. I simply checked a box and reran my forecasting model. And uh, the other offsets, frozen, we don't have any of those uh, selected, but sometimes we'll use things like that for forecast validation. Uh, and as a, a demand planner, you're not necessarily going to go into these models, but if you wanted to, you have the capabilities uh, to kind of view what IVP is doing in the background. And so uh, something else is the outlier correction. And I actually did a video, you'll find it on SEM Connections YouTube, if you wanna learn more about what outlier correction is, is doing. But uh, this is essentially cleansing your sales history. Okay, and so there are multiple different uh, detection methods. There is, we're using variance test, which uh, basically creates an upper and a lower threshold. And uh, it multiplies it by, the uh, gets the standard deviation multiplied by constant to get um, the upper and lower thresholds, and then you'll make that decision. It will make that decision for you automatically. It doesn't need to be corrected with the mean. And so the input's going to be actuals quantity, and the result uh, that we're going to take a look at is going to be here in the finals actuals cleansed. And so if I go back into Excel uh, without spending too much time, uh, if I go back into Excel, I have my actual quantity, my mean, so that's what my correction method is going to be. I have my standard deviation, I have my upper and my lower limits, and then I have uh, my actual cleanse, so I have the result of this outlier correction. So if you see here that this value, um, sorry, we'll start with this. So if you see that the actual is outside of this upper and lower limit, which it is, is at 299, it's outside of your, um, what you have as your variance, okay? Um, then it's gonna be replaced with this mean of actuals quantity. And so you'll see that if you continue to look, these, are, these values are outside of your limit. These are outside of your threshold that you set. Well, you come into this fourth week, and this just shows how dynamic IBP is, right? This is just happening automatically. Um, as a planner, I might not need to know what it's doing, but maybe I have an issue, or maybe I actually want to know what it's doing. I can always come back in here uh, and, and see what the outlier correction, what the pre-processing step is really doing. And so the biggest thing is that then uh, this value, um, 
what you're going to see at the end of my demo is I'm going to take this value, this new actuals cleanse, and then our old value before it was cleansed, and I'm going to compare the uh, stat forecast. I'm going to see how much different those look. And so uh, we're going to go back in. Uh, that was just the pre-processing steps. Uh, there are others. There are um, two others, substitute missing values. So that would be if there is a null in your history, a zero in your history, you can uh, do a similar correction with mean. And then promotion sales lift uh, is another pre-processing. So it will, it'll, basically what promotion sales lift uh, does for you is it will eliminate uh, a, a lift, it will eliminate an outlier if it, uh, if there's no promotion in the system. So if it looks like it was um, a promotion and you have uh, your promotion set up, then IVP is going to recognize it and it will leave it in your, your history. Um, and then the opposite will be true as well. So we will go back into our PowerPoint quickly. And so what did we just do? We just went through our, oh, let me change this. Bear with me. All right. So what did we just do? We went through this outlier correction, this pre-processing step. All right. Same thing. The system's checking whether uh, the values deviate from the mean uh, by more than the standard deviation multiplied by the constant. And so uh, our constant was one, but you know you can. We've seen. 2, 2.5, uh, the max is usually 3 because once you start getting over that, then uh, I think there's usually other issues kind of going on with the um, with your sales history or intermittency of data and you don't necessarily want to cleanse that. Uh, so um, the values that are shown as a deviation are replaced by outliers. So what I showed you was the mean replacement, how it replaces um, it replaces the actuals with the mean, but uh, there are other options uh, of replacement. You can do uh, an absolute value, and then you can also replace it with the median. And then we're going to kind of talk about forecasting steps. So I'm not going to go through every single one of the forecasting methods. Um, there are multiple. I think there's probably think there's around 20, if I don't quote me on that, but I, uh, there's a something around there. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to basically look at our forecast, okay? So our statistical forecast, the main input for this algorithm is going to be the actual quantity. That's just our sales history. Target is that forecast. <clears throat> and then the target for the ex post, that's what your forecast would have been, is going to be this um, ex post forecast quantity. And something that is underrated is actually this help function. Sometimes it really helps you if for some reason you don't remember what auto or Rima Sarima is actually doing, you can come in here and you can click on your, uh, you can click on help and you can basically find what strategy, what this means, uh, has a huge long list of um, what every single one of these forecast algorithms is doing. Uh, you know, triple X men smoothing is usually used for seasonal data. Um, and uh, you can add as many as you want to this. Um, that's something that um, that kind of comes standard. It's just we can we can add whichever ones you you would like to see. And so, how does IBP choose the best forecast? Okay. And uh, what what the method that we're choosing is choose best forecast. So what does that mean? It basically means that IBP is going to go through make a forecast comparison and it's going to say my lowest MAPE, that is what I am going to utilize as my best forecast. So if my triple exponential smoothing has lowest MAPE, then that is what I'm going to use uh, going forward. And then... Hey Megan, when it's if, reviewing the MAPE, what level is it doing that calculation at? It's doing it at a product location customer for every single product location customer combination. And then the same thing here for the post-processing uh, steps. So you'll see uh, a little bit later on, Pat's going to go into a little bit more detail about these. But uh, what you what you want to know is that we're using uh, the MAPE. 
and then we're also using the um, mace so we'll be able to see those errors and this is actually the value that uh, that IBP is using to calculate that uh, that forecast the lowest make to then calculate that forecast going forward and so how is the MAPE really being calculated? It's basically taking the actuals, the history, versus the ex post forecast that what the history would have been. And whatever the lowest error is, that's, uh, that's what your best fit is going forward. OK, so what does that look like? So we're going to look at our actuals going forward versus our that forecast and so we have historically from January and all this is doing is just showing you what the actuals are versus what the forecast and then starting in May we're going to pretend it's May 1 there's no actuals yet but you can see what your forecast is uh, kind of going forward and the other thing about this is if you are curious as to what method uh, it is actually using you can easily go in here, let's say, this is actually a really cool function and it really makes me nerd out because uh, I used to never be able to see what algorithm I was choosing. I just saw the forecast and so this, this has been a really good addition. All right, so what is this showing you? It's not the best view, but it has a lot of really good information as a planner. So I'm looking at this and I can see the MAPE. I can see the MAPE at every single location or every, yeah, every single location product customer combination. Now, what model is it choosing? Okay, you can see the MAPE on every single model that we have designated. So I just showed you auto exponential, simple. Uh, you can see all of those. So which model? Here, you're going to see that the lowest MAPE for this product location customer combination was 0.117. Okay, Auto Arima Serima was selected. Now, cool thing about this is that you can have different um, algorithms for different product combinations or different uh, product location customer combinations. So you can see that the Creston method was selected in some of these. The simple moving average was selected. You have a lot of different. Um, information that you can actually see and then um, you know understand what what kind of trends are happening or what is really it, like I said if you see that a lot of these are triple exponential you can maybe see that your um, that you have a lot of seasonal products simple moving average you have a lot of demand stability so to tie all of this together uh, with what I've showed you the new products the um, the outlier correction, I'm going to come into IDP and I'm going to show you next the um, the actuals cleansed, and then I want to see what my stat forecast looks like cleansed with that cleansed history. All right, so you'll see that it actually makes a big difference to have this cleansed history. And so you'll see that this is my statistical forecast quantity cleansed. So what is it using as the input? It's using this final actuals cleanse. And then you still have your regular statistical forecast. That's with the uncleansed data. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna be able to make a decision going forward to say basically which one of these um, has a lower error measure, which one of these is the actual correct uh, version to use, but you're also going to be able to see a big variation in what your cleansed values are and what your um, original values are. And that's going to get bigger, that variation is going to get bigger, but the more intermittency in your data, the um, the more nulls are, are uh, outside of the threshold that you're, that you're kind of looking at. So um, with that, I am going to pass it over to Pat. Hey, real quick, Megan, you did have one question yeah. on the promotions, specifically yes. around promotion functionality in IBP. How does it calculate any uplifts due to promotional demand and should use MLR for future uplifts with similar promotions? Uh, so 
for the promotions, the way that it is calculated is through the promotions app, basically. Um, and as far as the automation of how that is uh, kind of moves forward, I think, Mike, didn't you guys do something um, mm -hmm. using like automated something, one of the algorithms? I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, well, we use some of them. I've, I've used the actual uh, promotions app, which yeah. sort of literally takes it as an uplift or a promotion. Yeah. And then yeah. in other ones, you can use it and, and actually correlate it. And Pat, you've done a ton of work on this with some of the machine learning pricing models you did. Right, um, right. It kind of goes beyond the MLR for future future lifts. Yeah, in terms of, uh, in just kind of the, to answer the question, the hardest part here is kind of getting the right correlation between the promotion and the, the general uplift. Um, in terms of machine learning, that kind of pulls some of it out if you have that sales history behind it without actually taking the statistical model and doing a regression on it. Um, uh, so there's a bunch of ways to do that in terms of, uh, you know, but essentially you want to you want to normalize the data in the past and strip out the promotional activity and get a true forecast, right? What would be your baseline sales versus the, um, versus your promotional activity. Lots of different ways to kind of take that on in terms of, you know, where you make your adjustments, et cetera. So um, that's kind of a whole nother topic. Yeah, that might be a good one for the future. Yeah. Love to have the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> we could go on forever on it, but love to have the conversation. It, maybe it's a good topic for a future uh, future mm -hmm. webcast. And then one more question was around the level of mate for best fits. You you ran it at the customer product location company or customer, yeah, product combination. Do yep. you have to run yep. it at that, or can you have the um, best fit algorithm do an evaluation at a higher level than that? Yep. Like a more yep. aggregated. It's yep. You can have it at uh, basically any level. Um, it's easier. It's always easiest to start at that lower level, uh, is what we usually say. But if you don't have that data available, then yes, you can calculate it at that more aggregate level, uh, if needed. Okay. Right. Thanks, Megan. All right, Pat, take it away. Oh, okay. So we've got about uh, we got about ten more minutes, um, you know, and then we'll leave some time for some additional questions. Uh, so uh, thanks, Megan, um, for all of that. That's a lot of information around how to come up with a statistical forecast, and, and really, this is you know, this is kind of a high level. Um, there's a lot packed into what Megan showed. Um, we could sit here for weeks. Uh, kind of going through it. But what I want to show now is as you transition to, this is what, you know, I always say what the math provides, you know, the statistical analysis and the forecast using statistics will provide the best numbers that you can get, right? So you can dial that in, um, you know, and, and we're giving the best math, mathematically generated numbers based on history that we can, we can come up with. But history isn't always the only thing that's really driving your demand plan. Um, you know, there are certain things that you want to as a demand planner, right, and as part of your sales and operations planning um, that kind of come into your, your demand planning process. So if you think about things like your, uh, your statistical forecast quantities, one, the inputs that your demand planner has and the inputs that your demand planner puts behind the statistical forecasting based on their, their knowledge, et cetera, um, that's another kind of key input to the the demand planning process. Additionally, we have, you know, every company is a little bit different, whether on the commercial side or the sales side or marketing or kind of a combination of all of those. You have some external groups that are very tied into what the, the sales um, and what the demand will look like going forward. Maybe not in the long term, but certainly in that short to midterm, they'll have information that will be really kind of critical to get into your demand planning process. Um, so typically in this case, what we've modeled is a sales forecast quantity. That would be your sales team kind of coming in and bringing in numbers to say, yep, this is what I think our sales forecast will look like for the next year. Now, <clears throat> you also want to kind of bring that up against your annual operating plan or AOP quantity, right? And then take that and say, okay, how am I tracking to what I budgeted? Because that tends to to drive kind of your plan. Am I hitting my target for the year? Well, how does that impact my overall my revenue targets? How does that impact my supply targets? My um, attainment for on the supply side, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, I find in the sales and operations planning that that's kind of a key piece of data to say, 
how am I tracking revenue-wise, quantity-wise, um, volume for my annual operating plan. But kind of the whole thing here is to bring those different viewpoints and then come to a consensus demand plan. So if you look, what IBP allows you to do is kind of put those at an aggregate level or at a detail level, looking at the, the SKU, the actual customer level, et cetera. Every company is gonna be a little bit different in the way they aggregate or disaggregate the data and at the level that they want to create their consensus demand plan. What I'm showing in this particular view are a couple things, right? I'm looking at, I wanna, when I come up with my consensus plan and my consensus final decision, I wanna have the understanding of what my actual years, my prior year sales were. I wanna know what my statistical forecast quantity, what's the math telling me. I wanna know what my demand planning quantity, what did the demand planner actually kind of come up with, right? What are the numbers and based on the market intelligence, et cetera, that they know, past patterns, et cetera. And then I also wanna look and get input from my sales force, right? So is that head of sales, is that the actual um, sales uh, uh, salespeople on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. You wanna get that information in the system because it's gonna help you build a better consensus forecast, okay? And then again, I also wanna view that against my annual operating plan. One of the nice things about IBP is that I can do this and I can chart this pretty quickly. And here what I've got in my chart, right, and that's one of the kind of key features and probably a, a huge benefit for IBP, I can look by and look at those key figures because we're in Excel, I can create a chart for it and I can look at those key figures kind of dynamically, okay? And I can look at them. In this case, I can see that the green in the background was my prior year sales. The red, I've got the red line, that's my um, demand planning quantity. So that's what the demand planner is giving me. And then the yellow or the green line is gonna be my sales forecast quantity, okay? I can quickly, and I'm looking at this not at the SKU level, but I've aggregated all of this information up and I'm looking this at, at my customer region, okay? So again, this is kind of a test system. We have a lot of data in it, whatever, but I, I don't wanna be in an individual SKU kind of managing things. I wanna look at across the customers and let it disaggregate down, okay? Um, I can quickly, and now I'm looking at the West on my filter. I can take my filter off and look at everything, okay? And I can put my filter back on and then just look at the East, right? All the information below is what I'm viewing in my chart. And I can say, yep, it looks like I'm tracking this way. I'm gonna use the demand planning forecast, right? Again, this would all come out of your consensus demand planning process, come up with a forecast that's gonna go into SOP, okay? Now, <clears throat> companies and each, each company is a little bit different. Um, in IBP, and what we tend to recommend is taking a, a, a firm snapshot and saying, okay, this is the process that we're gonna do, um, and then kind of do the handoff to the next level, which would then be the supply planning. What I'm gonna show you here, um, some companies do a demand planning quantity, which would be the default, right? And then an override would happen for your consensus. I'm going to just take my demand planning quantity because I thought that was good and I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna copy that in my consensus demand plan. I did it for my entire customer region out on the East Coast. Everything will then be disaggregated downward. This can be automated as a job. It can be automated as part of the key figure calculation. So lots of options around this with IBP, very flexible, okay? So this is the whole process of coming up with a consensus demand plan. Again, this is what you're gonna take into your sales and operations planning process, but you have all the information to quickly high level look at an aggregate and then drill down if so, if you need to see it at the, at the detail level, okay? Um, and probably the thing that I'm most excited about and I think one of the best features of IBP is the ability to now not only take quantities, but also look at what my numbers are gonna provide within a revenue projection, okay? So what it does, you'll have a standard price, you may have a customer standard price, you may do that at the standard selling price at the, at the location when it's selling out of the DC, lots of kind of complexity within the design. But what you're trying to do is understand what the revenue implications of your demand changes are, and then kind of take those against, uh, pit those up against, um, your annual operating plan, okay? So in this case, what I've done 
is I've said, okay, my annual operating plan is on the back end from a revenue perspective. These are in dollars. Okay. And I've said, okay, that's what my AOP is telling me. And that's what I promised to the street. That's what I budgeted. I can look at my actuals revenue. This is what I've sold so far this year. So if you look at the blue columns, that's what's been sold so far this year. Okay. And then I can look at my demand planning revenue. That's what my demand plan is telling me should have happened or should happen. Okay. Going out for the next, for this calendar year. And then finally, my consensus demand plan revenue is what I'm actually planning for with supply. Okay. And so what that means is I may have a demand planning, and what's just telling me here is that I have a demand planning number. My demand planning revenue is higher than my consensus demand. So my consensus then said, yeah, I don't trust the demand planning number. There's something else I know. I'm going to bring uh, those numbers down and project smaller forecasts than I would at the demand planning. I don't trust the demand planner number, okay? But one of the things that's pretty interesting on the back is now I can say, now I'm only not only looking at the, the yearly numbers, I can also look at what my year-to-date numbers are. And you can summarize it in different time buckets in different, so I can look at weeks, technical weeks, months, quarters, years, et cetera. And then within my, um, within my planning view, I can say, give me the specific period. And I'll show you that real quick. In this case, I'm saying, I wanna see, I wanna not only see everything in months for the year 2020, I wanna see what the year to date total is from January through May, I can have that rolling. And then I wanna see what my full year aggregate is to see what I've done for the entire year. So what this allows me to do is if I'm a demand planner going to an SNOP plan, I can then say, what are my year to date um, numbers? In this case, I'm gonna scroll over here. And I can see from my actuals revenue, I'm at 3.24 for the East region. Um, my AOP revenue is 3.4. That's what I was expecting from an AOP, so I'm hitting that number. But on the demand planning side, I'm at 5.2, so there's a pretty significant gap. And my consensus demand planning is 3.98 year to date. Then I can take that and apply that to the full year and then to see if I, how, how close I'm going to be and what I need to do to make up that gap. Lots of flexibility around this, lots of different ways to, to accomplish this. With an IBP, it kind of gives you that flexibility. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to show is, and Megan, we're going to kind of tag team this one, is the ability to look at um, dashboards and look at different, in what we've shown before is forecast error metrics and um, forecast MAPE, et cetera. And what we want to show in this dashboard, IDP, is really on the web, show basically a, a collection of analytics, right? So these are each individual analytics, right? You've got your standards where uh, SAP will calculate your, your MAPE. Um, you can create your forecast accuracy based on those numbers. Um, what we found is that normally they, every company doesn't have its own uh, kind of idea of how they want to calculate their MAPE, et cetera. And they end up kind of optimizing these and using a different calculation. Um, so, in very flexible to do within within your own organization. Um, the one thing I want to kind of highlight here is uh, two things. Forecast bias is a metric that we highly recommend. It tells you how yep. much from an absolute perspective you're going above or below on a specific um, product group or family. Okay. And then the other that we're going to show a little bit further down here is the forecast value add. And the forecast value add, for those of you that haven't really used it or kind of seen this in play, is really the ability to compare the forecast accuracy of your statistical model, right? What does the math tell me versus your consensus demand plan or your demand planning um, quantities, et cetera. And then it can be created in lags, et cetera. But what you're trying to kind of accomplish within this is to say, to put a, a metric or a a performance indicator that gives you the kind of the the information. Are your planners spending a lot of time uh, creating, putting more into the system, or creating a demand that is not as accurate as the standard math? 
Okay. So when I look at this, I did a heat map on it and said, okay, um, anything that's in light orange is going to be a forecast value add that's positive. Anything that's dark orange is going to have a negative uh, forecast value add. So what it's telling me is that in IBP 200, I've got a negative 105% value add. So if I had a 50% or a 75% accuracy for stat forecast, I'm getting a 37% accuracy number within my demand planning number or my consensus demand planning number. So it's a way for you to kind of look at this, uh, look at the how good of a job your demand planners are doing. Are they actually adding value to your statistical? They're taking it away. If I look at IBP 300, being 166% increase, so they're adding value to that that particular SKU. Okay. Um, and I'm going to kind of I know that's a lot, and we're we're kind of we're at time at this point. So Mike, I'm going to kind of open it up to any questions we might have. Yeah, thanks, Pat and Megan. That was really good, and especially tying it together with the metrics and the dashboards. I think it helps to say. You know, you can get demand planning down in the weeds, but then what do you do with it? How do you get better, right? And this gives you a lot of really clear and actionable information and how to have a, an IBP platform in demand really deliver that full end-to-end -end, uh, value to the business. Right, and I think, that, uh, I think that for this forecast value add, you know, a lot of times as a planner, you spin your wheels, you spin your wheels, and you make these adjustments. And this allows you to actually see are the adjustments that I'm spending time on, are they worth it? No? Okay, I'm going to let IBP kind of, you know, smooth it, do its own thing, and come back and check maybe a month later and say, okay, this is where I need to start making adjustments because IBP isn't making the right decision. So this forecast value add is really impactful. Right. And, and layering on top of that, then the next the next level to take it is to say, how, how much forecast value add am I adding to my E? SKUs as opposed to my B SKUs as opposed to my C products. And, and when you start doing that, now you're able to say, I'm focusing on the right things that actually matter. And then I can also look at this in revenue to say, how much forecast value add am I doing from a revenue perspective for my high, my high dollar items as opposed to the stuff, my cats and dogs that I sell twice a, you know, twice a year. So pretty, pretty impressive information that you can get out of IBP. Yeah, really. Cool. Well, we're just about out of time, and I don't see any questions, but we had a couple come through, which I really appreciate. Uh, Megan and Pat, awesome job as usual. Um, you're getting to be quite quite the dynamic duo on these webinars. Thanks, everybody, for attending uh, another great SCM Connections webinar. You can find us at scmconnections.com on LinkedIn. This will be posted to our YouTube channel. And so um, if there's any more questions in the future, please reach out. We'd love to help. And um, there's actually a survey at the end of this webinar as well that you'll get. Please fill that out and put in ideas for more webinars. That's where this one came from. Um, was a, uh, an attendee from a prior one that just had an idea that this is something they wanted to see. We love that. So fill out your survey and make sure that you um, give us ideas. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks.